Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our websites, CompassionateCooks.com, as well as JoyOfVeganBaking.com. Hi, everybody. It is so nice to be here. It is so beautiful out today in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm just thrilled, even though I haven't really been outside all day. <laughs> so hopefully at some point I'll get to go outside, but I've been inside and working on things. So yeah, so I need to get outside. Anyway, before I do, I want to spend some time with you first. And the first thing I'd like to do is thank all of you. Thank you to the listeners and the subscribers and um, and everyone who keeps spreading the word about this podcast. And of course, thank you to the podcast sponsors. I'm very, very grateful for your support. And I couldn't do this without you. Literally, I couldn't do this without you. Your help makes the hours and hours I put into the podcast worth it and quite frankly possible. So thank you to all of the sponsors. And I would like to send a special thank you to today's sponsor, the sponsor of today's Today's episode, and that's Casey Leopardi. Hi, Casey. I chose her as the sponsor of today's episode because of the content of her email. She wrote, I finally decided to support your podcast after listening faithfully for the last few months. I happened upon your deliciously frank podcast after deciding this summer to stop eating meat and to start researching how to take control of my eating and living habits. I drove cross country this summer, stopping many times to take pictures of the landscapes and the critters who resided there. I have many pictures of cows in particular, their lovely large eyes and their poor sweet ears tagged and numbered. After many instances of stopping and looking into their eyes, my mind became made up that I would never be able to look at eating animal flesh in the same way again. I came home, and after hearing you speak repeatedly of it, I bought and read Diet for a New America. It has changed my life, and I now feel armed not only with compassion and fortitude for the decision I have made, but also with logical and researched facts. I have developed a love of cooking and a childlike excitement for learning about this whole new outlook on life. I have been happier, more whole, and more committed to my yoga practice, all because I know I'm living a truly peaceful existence. I commend you for being a smart, driven, and committed woman. You are a gift to this world. You are a gift to this world, Casey. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support and for your very, very kind words. And thank you for being open and for sharing your experiences with me and with the podcast listeners. Obviously, I, I chose for you to sponsor this podcast today because we're going to talk all about cattle, and I thought it was appropriate that you be part of this episode. The power of the animals themselves is really remarkable, just being in their presence and looking into their eyes and being aware of their consciousness, of their individuality, of their personality. It's truly profound. And if you've never found yourself in the presence of cows and steers, I highly recommend that you go out right now and change that and spend some time with them because they're really quite remarkable creatures and clearly they have the ability to change lives so that's pretty that's pretty powerful so thank you again Casey and um, the support of listeners is vital to this work as I said and if you can spare um, whatever you can either ten dollars a month or five dollars a month or fifteen dollars a month there's lots of options on the website uh, or one-time contributions whatever you can do really helps me to spread the word and you are doing a great service to the animals both human and non-human and I thank you for that to be part of this work, just visit CompassionateCooks.com and click on Support Our Podcast and thank you in advance. And please, if you haven't yet, please join our new message board, which you can also access through CompassionateCooks.com under Podcast. Click on Message Board and you can connect with just so many fabulous, all of the fabulous listeners who've joined the message board. It's just such a joy to look at the messages and the posts on that message board. You truly are just an amazing group of people and it's just so lovely. So, so connect with other listeners right away by joining the message board. I've said this before, but I really am amazed that we have as many episodes as we do and we haven't covered such obvious topics as cattle. The term cattle may seem rather clinical, um, or it sounds like it's driven by the ranching and beef industry, but 
I can't help using it when referring to both the females and the males, though it's tempting to just say cows, which we often do. It's really not accurate, as cows are the female bovines and steer and bulls are the male bovines. Now, technically, a heifer is a cow who has not yet given birth, but that word, heifer, to me, is so rooted in the animal exploitation industry that I don't like using it. Besides, it categorizes an animal based on her output, you know, based on her reproductive system, whether or not she calves, and that has everything to do with the animal exploitation industry, who's either going to use that calf for um, for meat or or, or for her for her milk. So I don't like the word heifer, and I realize it's a fine line, and I, I may be splitting hairs here, but that's partly the trouble with language in general, and our language in particular. Some things just transcend language and make it difficult to express the essence of a thing. And then there's the issue of humans inventing the words that we use, and some of them may or may not be rooted in exploitation or speciesism or racism, etc. So so let's just take a closer look at the words cow and steer and bull and ox. So you have a clear idea of what I mean when I use these words, and so you have an understanding of these words as they relate to the animals in history and in the present time. Now a bull, as you probably know, is an uncastrated male, hence their use in such ridiculous sports as bullfighting, they've got a lot of testosterone in those big bodies of theirs and humans have been testing their own strength and virility or lack thereof um, with that of the bull. So bulls are uncastrated males, fully intact, if you will. A steer is a castrated male and steers are the ones who are raised for quote unquote beef. Now, as I said, a cow is a female and I suppose technically a cow refers to the female who has produced a calf and a heifer is a young female who has not had any offspring. But as I said, I'm just gonna be referring to all females as cows. Now, finally, an ox is a castrated male male, like the steer, but the word ox simply refers to the fact that an ox is used as a source of power, for instance, for pulling carts or plows, as opposed to the castrated males who are raised and killed for human consumption, steers. So same animal, but just named differently depending on, on human use of this animal. Does that make sense? Now, I'd like to step back even further and talk about their ancestors. I think it's a fascinating history. Now, I know in a previous episode, I already talked about the fact that the word cattle is derived from the Middle English and the Old Northern French word cattle, C-A-T-E-L, as well as the Latin word capitale, C-A-P-I-T-A-L-E, or capital, in the economic sense of the word. The Latin word for wealth, pecunia, comes from the word for cattle, which is pecus, P-E-C-U-S. So you see the root of the word reflects the use of the animal in the ancient world. All of these words are related, cattle, capital, chattel, property, money, wealth, pecuniary, and goods. All of these are related by their roots, and they all have to do with the fact that owning livestock, and the word cattle, by the way, first referred to all livestock animals, not just bovines, was a measure of wealth in the ancient world. So do you see the connection just in terms of language between the owning of non-human animal slaves and the owning of human slaves? The word chattel has come to mean slave. So let's look at the word that classifies cattle into a much larger family of bovines. Bovines. They belonged to this family, bovines, before they were considered livestock. They did exist, you know, as wild animals before humans began domesticating them. What was their history? What was their background? What was their ancestry, their legacy? They do have one outside of their fateful encounter with humans, but we tend to forget that because we see them only in their role now as property, as chattel of humans. Along with sheep and goats and antelope, cattle belong to the family of horned ruminant herbivores called bovidae um, or bovines. Within this family, cattle belong to the subfamily bovinae and the genus bos, B-O-S. All domestic cattle in the world today are descended from a single wild species, bos primigenius or 
aurochs, and that's what we're going to call them from now on, aurochs, A-U-R-O-C-H, aurochs, a species which is now extinct because of, guess who, humans um, drove them to extinction. And the earliest representative of the genus Boss appeared about two million years ago in Asia, and they resembled antelopes. They stood two meters high, that's about six and a half feet high, and they were three meters, almost 10 feet long, and their horns also grew up to two meters meters long. And despite what was most likely a lot of weight to carry, they were very agile animals and they were quite feared by humans. Now, eventually the aurochs migrated to the Middle East and Northeast Africa and reached Europe about 250,000 years ago. Now, the world back then was much wetter and much greener, and they ate grass and herbs. They ate tree foliage and bark in the spring and the summer, and in the winter, they ate acorns and dry leaves. Now, we'll come back to the harm we're causing our cattle today, the ones that we're raising for human consumption by feeding them grain, but just bear with me and know that um, the stomach of all bovines were built specifically to digest all these plant foods, all this fiber. Now, I won't get into the details because you know basically that they have four stomachs which enables them to eat the plants that most mammals, including humans, cannot digest. Their multi-chambered stomach is quite impressive. It's a quite impressive mechanism for digesting food. So I said that aurochs were feared by humans, so that means at some point they came into contact with humans, right? And they did. Now, we're not sure exactly when this took place, but early European cave paintings indicate that by 17,000 B.C., so that's obviously about 19,000 years ago, humans had seen and were quite impressed by these creatures. Now, I said that these animals appeared about 2 million years ago and then were, were discovered by humans at least 19,000 years ago, which means there were a good many years when aurochs lived peacefully and without much trouble before humans came around. Now, humans obviously began hunting aurochs. And from what I can gather, and I think this is really interesting and I think it's important, they weren't hunted merely for consumption by humans, as we so like to believe was our early relationship with the rest of the natural world. Though their flesh was eaten by early humans and their hides were used as clothing and their bones were used as jewelry and as tools and their, home, their horns were used as vessels and their fat was used as oil, it appears that all of this was secondary to the primary reason they were hunted because of the challenge they represented. Now, as I said, humans like to prove themselves to, well, to themselves and to each other. And hunting down and killing an aurochs was considered quite a feat, mainly because it was so risky. It was a test of manhood. Maybe it was an initiation rite for young men. But it became very popular, so popular that aurochs hunting became a hobby and a duty almost of the aristocracy, and they became extinct because of hunting in Egypt. But they remained in Europe for a short time before we drove them to extinction there. Now, Julius Caesar wrote about this. I, I think it's just an interesting quote to include in, in his book, Gallic Wars. And by the way, he calls them Uri, U-R-I, which is Latin for the word aurochs. Okay. So he wrote, uh, those animals, which are called Uri, these are a little below the elephant in size and of the appearance, color, and shape of a bull. Their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast, which they have espied. These the Germans take with much pains in pits and kill them. The young men harden themselves with this exercise and practice themselves in this sort of hunting. And those who have slain the greatest number of them, having produced the horns in public to serve as evidence, receive great praise." By the 15th century, due to loss of habitat induced by humans, uh, grazing competition from their domesticated descendants induced by humans, and hunting by humans, the time of the aurochs was nearly over. Though the Polish did try to preserve them, they allowed a certain amount of hunting by the noblesse, it was too late. With the death of the last aurochs cow by poachers in 1627, the aurochs gained the dubious honor of being the first documented case of animal extinction. The second is the dodo. 
Now, as you noticed, I mentioned the grazing competition by their domesticated descendants, so we have to back up a bit when we talk about when humans domesticated the aurochs and why. The when is easy, the why not so much. They began domesticating the aurochs in about 6000 BC. Now, sheep and goats were already domesticated by this time, sheep being the first animals that humans took from the wild and made their own. And experts don't really know why humans domesticated the aurochs when, quite frankly, they were already using sheep and goats for their flesh and their milk and their skins. Some people believe that it was not out of necessity because there wasn't a necessity, but rather for religious and spiritual reasons as the trapped animals were often killed as sacrifices for rituals performed to keep their crops and other animals fertile. So again, I think it's just really interesting to rethink our long-held, very simplistic notion about why we domesticated animals in the first place. It was more complicated than, well, humans were hungry and we needed to eat, and so we had to sacrifice animals in order for us to survive. It's a little more complex than that. The early domesticated cattle depending on where they were being bred, developed into two distinct types, kind of two strains. There's the humpless cattle, Bos taurus, in the Near East and Africa. And these are the ones that eventually made it to Europe. Okay, so Bos taurus. Taurus, does that sound familiar for those of you who are under the sign of Taurus? Um, and then there's the humped uh, cattle, um, or zebu, they're also called, and that's the Bos indicus. And that, and they're in India, and they that line is still in India. And they're very distinct looking. I, I've met several of them. Uh, there are a few at Farm Sanctuary of those that come from the Indian line, and they look a little different, have kind of longer faces and kind of a, a waddle, a longer waddle. Nonetheless, this is when cattle began being regarded as reflections of wealth. Um, and though the animals were being used and traded and killed and eaten, they were also protected in some ways because they were property and they were expensive to keep. To lose your animal was to lose your economic security. So to protect their property, the Europeans, like I said, the humpless boss Taurus um, or Taurian cattle that, that came to Europe, they devised rituals to keep their cows fertile and to ward off diseases and thieves. But disease did come and it didn't spread only among the cattle. It spread to humans as well. As humans and cattle lived closer together, the chances of infections and disease increased through feces, through urine, through breath and sores and blood. Remember, we're all mammals, so we share many of the same diseases. We don't share diseases with plants. We don't get aphids. We don't get sooty mold or downy mildew or any disease that any tree or plant you have in your yard would get. But we do share diseases with other animals. What are some of these diseases? Do you know? Can you guess? How about tuberculosis, measles, smallpox, also known as cowpox? These diseases that humans are now exposed to came to us because of our close contact with cattle. No doubt. I'm not. This isn't make. I'm not making this up. There's no doubt that we have these diseases because of our contact with cattle. Now, here's the really interesting part. How did we begin to deal with these diseases? With vaccines. Vaccines. Get it? Do you recognize a root word in there? Vaca, right? The Latin word vacinus means cow. Vaca, Spanish for cow. Vaca, Italian for cow. Vash, French. The word vaccine derives from the same word for cow because the vaccines for these cattle-derived diseases contain the diseases themselves in the hope of building up an immunity to these cattle-derived diseases. So cattle were often used in ritual sacrifices, as I said, and they were revered as gods or they were associated with gods by many cultures and many civilizations. And again, you know, of course, I have a problem with the fact that they were used in ritual sacrifices, but you know they were revered in their in their own way in Mesopotamia among the Sumerian people in ancient Egypt, in India, and in ancient Greece. And as Christianity emerged, it began to wipe out the bull worship of many cultures and religions. In fact, at the Council of Toledo in 447, the Christian church published its first official description of the devil. And in this description, you can see how this early perception has continued to shape our depiction of animals today, all animals, not just cattle. So here was the description of Satan in the Council of Toledo in 447. 
a large black monstrous apparition with horns on his head, cloven hooves or one cloven hoof, ass's ears, hair, claws, fiery eyes, terrible teeth, an immense phallus and a sulfurous smell. Bull worship did indeed eventually disappear um, after that, though the cow is still revered in parts of India, and we'll talk about that more another time. But stories about the strength and power of these amazing animals endured. We see this in Celtic legends and in Roman and Greek myths, but... Unfortunately, humans cannot live well enough alone, so while they have been admired, uh, these animals have also been forced to provide entertainment for humans for thousands and thousands of years, and these hideous and barbaric games continue to this day. There was something called bull leaping in, in Minoan Crete during the Bronze Age, and this is still practiced in some places today in the southwest of France and in some parts of Spain. It tends not to evolve any direct harm to the animal although he is forced into a ring to be a spectacle while the person shows off his acrobatic prowess by leaping and pole vaulting around the bull. It's obviously very stressful for the animal as well as dangerous for the person. In the same place and time, there was also a public spectacle that could best be described as bull wrestling, where a man grasps the bull by the muzzle and by the horns, twists his head around, and tries to throw him to the ground. This was replicated in Wild West shows in the 1880s in the United States and is now an event in our lovely modern rodeo, but now it's called bulldogging or steer dogging. Now, of course, in the modern rodeo, there's also bull riding, in which the rider's goal is to stay on the bull for eight seconds. The bulls used for this purpose are specially bred to buck wildly, adding to the entertainment value. And a bucking strap is also tied around the back part of the bull, and it encourages him to buck even more. Also, electric prods are often used to prod the animal out of the chute to begin the entertainment and to, and to really get him all riled up. Now, the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain, and bull chasing in South India are both dangerous and cruel in my opinion and they involve facing down these huge animals and either succeeding by not getting trampled or gored in the first case in the running of the bulls um, or by actually overtaking the animal in the second case in South India the animal in the South India case is first made agitated or drunk this desire to use animals for our own entertainment purposes took much darker forms but they, they say a lot about the human need to perceive non-human animals as vicious and violent and the natural world as chaotic and uncivilized. We have to keep up that perception in order to justify subduing non-human animals as well as nature. We have to depict wild animals and nature as something that needs to be controlled. If we didn't depict animals and nature that way, then we would have nothing to control. We have to create that perception, right? So we devise brutal and despicable competitions where we pit not only human against animal, where we pit animal against animal. And this is seen today still in dog fighting and cock fighting. Now in ancient Rome, animals were pitted against men as well as other animals in what were called venatio or hunting games. This should be no surprise to you, of course. You're most certainly aware of, of the bloody contest of the gladiator games. And gladiators, by the way, were slaves forced to participate, not unlike the animals. And these took place in Roman amphitheaters such as the Colosseum or the Circus Maximus was another Colosseum they used. Thousands of animals, thousands of animals, most of them wild animals stolen from their homes in Africa would be slaughtered in one day for these events thousands of them. Men would stage hunts. They would create sets that resembled actual forests. They would also pit animals against each other. As I said, bulls were forced into the ring with elephants and tigers and rhinoceroses and wild boar and lions and other animals were also victims. They would bring in giraffes and panthers and leopards and crocodiles and ostriches. And one of the things they would do is they would chain a bull to say a panther until each animal was completely ripped to shreds by the end. And that was entertainment. But as I said, we haven't come that far. We still do things like this. So let's not be too hasty to judge our Roman predecessors, but that's the kind of thing they did. Now, much later on, the national sport of England 
which persisted from the 13th to the 19th century, 600 years, was what was known as bull baiting. Now, when I was in London, we visited one of these sites, which were often outside of taverns where these blood sports took place. And it was awful just standing there imagining these things. And then recently in an antique shop in New Jersey, I came across a series of really bizarre prints which depicted bull baits. And uh, there was like five prints and one was bull baits, one was bear baiting. One, I'd have to go look, I think I took a picture with my cell phone, but one was this print of another kind of cruel uh, event. I can't even call it an event um, where, what was the animal? I can't remember what the animal was now. Some kind of beaver or something like that where they would throw the animal up in the air or something and then like have a long spike that they would use to catch the animal onto this live animal I mean just really sick stuff so apparently the the origin of the bull baiting which I I feel it's worth saying this because I think it's interesting the origin of the of the bull baiting uh, was from the false notion that stressing a bull would tenderize its flesh it was like butchers were part of this process because they thought well if you stress a bull through these bull baits you tenderize their flesh and they taste better well not that this is a valid reason for the torture but the irony is that stressed animals and I don't know a more stressful atmosphere than a slaughterhouse actually makes an animal's flesh tougher, I'm told. Anyway, so I think that's interesting because butchers had a part in this these early games. So the way it worked is that a bull was chained to a stake and then dogs, specially bred for this purpose, would be set on the bull. Can you guess what dog breed was bred specifically for this purpose? If you guessed bulldog, you would be correct. Bulldog. Get it? bulldog. English bulldogs were used and bred for this purpose. It was a gruesome event in which both the dogs and the bulls would be killed. Men would breed dogs, like I said, for this purpose. And they would send one dog in after the other. And the bulls um, became were mauled, obviously, by the dogs. And the dogs were literally broken. The bulls wouldn't necessarily gore the dogs, but they would get their horn under the belly of the dog and they would throw him upward. And then the dog would land on the ground and break his back fun stuff and this went on for 600 years it was incredibly popular and of course it became an opportunity for gambling and bets were placed on who the winner would be and the winner would get a crown piece now a crown is a type of coin that was in circulation by the 1800s and so for the purposes of this bet the crown was called a bull's eye whoever won won the bull's eye Hmm. so now This wasn't done with bulls, as I said, only it was also done with bears and they would do the same thing. And it was very common. In in fact, most towns had rings just for this purpose. They took place twice a week by the 18th century. And these rings were called bear gardens, which I think is quite euphemistic for something so, so violent. So both bear and bull baiting were made illegal in the Cruelty to Animals Act in 1835, finally, which passed, by the way, because of lobbying by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the RSPCA, which was founded in 1824 by a few men, including none other than William Wilberforce, who is the member of parliament who's pretty much solely responsible for abolishing slavery in the British Empire. I love those connections. I love those connections. And and the fact that he was so appalled by human slavery, his compassion extended to animals too. There's a, there was a movie that was made recently called Amazing Grace uh, about Wilberforce. And the movie's flawed. I don't think it's an amazing movie, but the story I think is more interesting than anything else. And the movie alludes to a few things that he did on behalf of animals, but he's obviously more well known for abolishing slavery <laughs> over over many, many years. It took him to finally get the um, bill passed or get the bill even talked about, discussed in Parliament. So he's, he's obviously well known for that. But the RSPA was founded by Wilberforce and others to protect farmed animals, particularly cattle, from cruelty, which means, of course, that they were already victims of cruelty. Now, the truth is, people did try to make these games illegal for years, but many members of parliament would enjoy these bear baits and these bull baits, and Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth loved these spectacles, so they wouldn't do anything about it. And what's interesting is that some people claim that the reason these sports ended 
again, sports in quotation marks, was not because of the cruelty to the animals. Um, some people were fighting for that, of course. But some law, the lawmakers who changed the law say that they were concerned that witnessing the violence of these baits encouraged violence towards each other, that when you're in an atmosphere of violence, it encourages violence to another. Hmm. What an interesting concept. So apparently, uh, another type of entertainment endured in England before it too became illegal in 1835, and that was one in which a wild bull had fireworks stuck all over him, and then he was turned loose to run through the streets. A similar event took place annually in several parts of England, something called the bull running, whereby a bull would have his ears cropped cut off, his tail cut down to a stump, his body smeared with soap, and his nose stuffed with pepper, and he would run around in a mad state, of course, and everyone would try to catch him. That was the fun entertainment. Now that, of course, leads us to bullfighting, whose popularity is waning, particularly in Spain. A 2002 Gallup poll found that nearly 70% of Spaniards express, quote, no interest in bullfighting. And bullfighting is banned in many countries. It's banned in many Spanish cities. And you may know that in 2004, Barcelona, the Barcelona City Council uh, voted against bullfighting. It was kind of a symbolic vote at this point because it still continues to this day, but it's against the majority of public opinion. And I thought this was pretty interesting along the lines of what I said about violence begetting violence. In August 2007, state-run Spanish television canceled live coverage of bullfights, claiming that the coverage was too violent for children who might be watching, and that live coverage violated some voluntary industry-wide code attempting to limit sequences that are particularly, quote-unquote, crude or brutal. So... There is hope. There is progress. And I believe that someday all blood sports that involve animals will all but disappear. Perhaps that's the optimist in me, but that's what I foresee. So there's just a little history for you about about these amazing animals, about our relationship to them and our use of them as instruments of entertainment. I have so much more to say about cattle, about our breeding of them to be used for their flesh, about the history of the, the Western United States. The West was shaped by the cattle ranching industry. Um, I want to talk about the relationship between cattle ranching and global warming, um, between cattle ranching and deforestation, about the popularity of grass-fed cattle versus grain-fed cattle, about the differences between quote-unquote organic and grass-fed, and the marketing spin around these products, about cattle cloning, and about the fabulousness of these peaceful and contemplative creatures we clearly have a lot to talk about. And through stories and, and narratives and through the episodes on cows used for their milk, I've talked a lot about the females and their relationship to their offspring. But I really do look forward to telling you about some of the steers, the males, who are the innocent victims of both the beef and the dairy industries. I very much look forward to telling you about some very special individuals, such as Linus, who's my baby, and Eli and Roberti and Mario and some wonderful, wonderful individuals. I'll leave you with that thought in mind and commend all of you who are lucky enough to be born under the sign of the Taurus, the sign of the bull, between April 20th and May 20th. May we all strive to have the characteristics of the cattle and seek to be hardworking and playful, prudent and loving, maternal and attentive, comforting and strong and cautious trustworthy and calm, resourceful and tenacious and loyal and protective, with a great sense of humor and an appreciation of the herd with whom we run. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. <laughs>